scripture this evening is Luke 13, 6 through 9. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. You know, as we look in Scripture, we see Jesus viewed by people in a, a number of biblical ways. Some people look at Jesus and they see the good shepherd. And we, we look at those, the idea and uh, behind what it means to be a shepherd and taking care of sheep. Others look at him as a deliverer. And we, we might look back to Moses and that kind of idea and, and how he delivers us from the slavery of sin as Moses delivered the Israelites from the Egyptian slavery in that day. And even Moses said that God was going to raise up one like unto him, talking about Jesus Christ in prophecy there. Some think of Jesus in maybe some of the more military type texts that we have in the scripture, you know, putting on the whole armor of God, that, that he is the leader of the army of God. Uh, and, you know, we can certainly take and, and look at the I am statements and, and how Jesus is represented in, in those various statements in the book of John. We can think about what John the Baptist says when he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So we can look at Jesus that way too, right? That he is that sacrificial lamb. Later John would write in Revelation, that lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ. So there's a lot of ways that we can look at Jesus in the ways that the Bible portrays him. And we can see the different ideas uh, concerning him that can be learned from each of those different views. But I want us to consider Jesus in a way that maybe we haven't very often. At the resurrection, there on that Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene standing outside the, 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 the tomb there, and someone comes up and she thinks it's the gardener. That's what she says. And she actually says, you know, if you know where they've taken my master, tell me. I love Mary Magdalene. I love that whole scene with her. And Jesus says her name, and instantaneously she knows who it is. She turns and she grabs a hold of him, and Jesus says, you know, do not cling to me. <laughs> I've, got, I've got things I've got to do. I, have you not yet ascended? But she thought he was the gardener. Now, we might look at that and we say, well, Nathan, that, there in John chapter 20, and verses 14 through 16, that's kind of incidental, and I, I'll agree with that. It is an incidental thing. They were, you know, in a tomb in an area where there was a garden, and so uh, thinking that there might be a gardener there is, is, is something that's truly incidental to Mary. But that's not the only place that we would see that applied to Jesus. We see him in this role here in Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, and I want us to take three lessons from this parable uh, about Jesus the gardener. The one that is tending to us. Now this parable certainly uh, you know, is, is dealing more in regard to what Jesus was going to do with Israel, but there is still an application for us in our lives today. First thing that we see in regard to a gardener is there is an expectation, Right? If you're going to go out and you're going to plant something, if you're going to go through the labor uh, of planting seed and, and watering and tending and weeding and all the things that you have to do as a, as a gardener of plants, then you're going to expect something in return from that, right? Now, if you just love flowers, you're expecting the return of pretty flowers. Now, if you're a farmer, you're looking for some crop, right? You're wanting some food. You're wanting something to sell. And so there is an expectation, first of all, that every gardener has in regard to the things that he plants. Look at verses 6 and 7. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, that's the gardener, 
Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And so the the master here, he comes to his vineyard and he sees this tree and he walks over to it and there's no fruit on it. And this isn't like the first time that he's walked up to the tree, right? He says, this tree hasn't borne any fruit now for three years. This tree has not been productive. And when we look at this, we see that God expects each and every one of us individually to bear fruit. We're not called to be trees, we're called to be fruit-bearing trees. And so, you know, to grow, when we think about bearing fruit, we're talking about to grow uh, proof in our lives that we are serving Him, that we are His disciples, that we are living as He would have us to live. And that fruit might take on the, the idea of our knowledge, our knowledge growing in Him, and in that knowledge, uh, our works that we're doing in the Lord's church and what we're doing in our Christian lives individually. Those are things that we bear fruit for the Master in. It might be in my personal life in overcoming weaknesses that I have, overcoming those areas in my life that I'm not doing as good as I need to do. When I overcome those things and I get better in those areas, that's fruit that's born as a result of the work of Jesus Christ. So those are the things that God is looking for. And so we have to ask ourselves as we look at what is said here in this parable, am I bearing fruit? Am I a plant that is bearing fruit for the master? Or am am I something that is disappointing? And God looks and says, how many years am I going to continuously come to this person and them still not have any fruit showing, still not having moved forward in their Christian life? Am I going to disappoint God in His expectations that I bear fruit? Our relationship with God must be about more than simply the salvation of my soul. My relationship with God has to also be about my being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And every disciple, when he is taught by the teacher that he follows, Jesus said becomes like the teacher himself. That's a fruit that I take on the qualities, the nature of Jesus Christ as I follow Him. You know, sometimes I think people can become so obsessed with I want to be saved, I want to be saved, they forget what you really want to be is a disciple. And that takes care of the salvation part. We are to make disciples of all nations there in the Great Commission. To make people that want to follow Jesus, want to be like Jesus, want to learn from Jesus. And so we are called to be just that. There comes a time, and and we see it here, and we see it in Hebrews chapter 5 as well, but there comes a time that God expects something of us. There comes a time, and, and God knows us perfectly. He knows exactly what I don't do that I should. He knows everything about me, what the time that I give, that I should have given to Him, that I could have given to Him. You know, we always have our excuses, right? Well, I had to do this, or I had to do that, or I was, you know, there was... But God, see, He sometimes we say those things, and those things may have some reality to them, but they're really not good excuses. God sees through them. And He knows where I, if I had been giving my life as I should to the things of Jesus Christ, to the gospel. He knows where I'd be right now if I'd done that. Now, I may be only here instead of here, right? So that's, what he, that's, that, that's what's said to the Christians in, in Hebrews chapter 5, is that, for by this time you ought to have been teachers. You see, God says, I know where you should have been, but you're not. And in fact... You need to go all the way back and learn the basics, very fundamental things that you learned at the beginning all over again. Not only have you not grown, you've actually atrophied, weakened in your life. And so God has expectations, and He has an expectation about where I should be. God knows perfectly where I should be, and He also knows perfectly where I am. And we need to think in our own minds where that measures up. 
and, and whether or not we are really giving what we should to growing in Christ Jesus. So we see that there is an expectation, an expectation of growth, an expectation of fruit. But we also see that there is patience. In verses 8 and 9, it says, And he answered, this being the, 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 the vineyard keeper, the gardener, And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. You know, the gardener works on our behalf. I may not have borne the fruit I should, and the gardener here says, well, let me, let me work with it. Let me help it. Let me fertilize it. Let me give it the things it needs to grow and, and see if, if it bears fruit by next year. Let's give it a little more time. I love that image of Jesus, that patient image, the one that says, I want to, I want to do everything I can to try to help them. You know, we can see, I mean, it's, I, I don't want to, you know, the, the, while we're using this as God being the, the master, the, the Father being the master, we don't want to, uh, you know, say he's not patient either, right? Because first, or Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says that God is not uh, slack concerning his promise, but he's patient toward us, right? Long-suffering, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So Jesus, here in this particular text, he doesn't want to give up on us. But he appeals for more time to help us become faithful. He recognizes, though, that there is a time, there is a place where God's patience runs out. Where God says, this isn't about growth, this is about just willing sin. Where Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26 says, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. You know, Jesus provides all that we need, folks to bear fruit if we'll just let him. In John chapter 15, not before Jesus dies, there in the upper room, he says in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. See, the vine is where all the nutrients come from, right? You've got to be attached to that. That's what he's talking about. You and me and me and you. What comes forth from me is inside of you. And then as the branch, you bear that fruit from the nutrients received from the vine. Jesus said, I'm the vine. You're the branches. And I'll give you everything you need if you will just abide in me. In other words, put your life in the center of who I am. Not in the center of what the world is, what the world thinks, but in the center of what I think. That you surround yourself with my teachings. Then if you do that, he says you will bear fruit. But he also says that if you don't do that, you won't do anything. There, are, there is no fruit born outside of Jesus Christ. It's all from him and from what he does through us. So there is an expectation of fruit. There is, in this particular case with the gardener, there is a patience. Let's just give it some more time. Let me do some more stuff with it to try to make it better. But there is also, last of all, there is accountability. There in verse 9 at the end of what where he talks about uh, there about digging around and putting fertilizer and seeing if it bears fruit next year. He finishes that with, but if not, cut it down. Now, Jesus talked about being the vine and the branches. He said something very similar, right? That if you don't bear fruit, you're going to get pruned off the vine. See, there's the idea. Remember the master, what the master said? He said, this tree hasn't borne any fruit. It's wasting my soil. It's drawing nutrients from my other plants that are bearing fruit, Right? And Jesus, the same way, that if you're not bearing fruit, you are drawing from the vine and not using it. And that's a waste. And so he'd be pruned just like any plant would be in such a situation. It is not beyond the owner of the vineyard to cut the tree down, to stop that waste of resources, to stop that waste of soil. Let a person who doesn't want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ 
causes. God's patience will come to an end if we continue to refuse to grow. If we continue to refuse to move forward in our devotion to Him. That's what Romans 1 when we, this morning when we are studying there that God gave them over. You know, there came a point where people just chose not to retain God in their knowledge, and it says he just gave them over to do it. If that's what you want, God says, I will let you go do it. I will give you over to go do those things that will destroy you. We look in the Old Testament, and we see the nation of Israel. And we see their... God sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. We have the minor prophets. We have prophets that are, don't even have books in the Bible, but they're written about in, in First, Second Kings and, and, and the Chronicles. And they're constantly saying, turn back to the Lord. Be more faithful. Call on the Lord while he'll listen to you. But there came a day when God said, no more prophets. Then he destroyed the nations. In fact, at the very beginning of the book of Ezekiel, the people didn't like Ezekiel's prophecies because Ezekiel didn't have any prophecy of hope. Beginning of the book, it's all one thing. Guess what? You caused this, and now you're going to drink the full cup of your iniquity. I'm not here to tell you things are going to get better tomorrow because they're not. And so there came a point where God said, that's enough, and he cut the tree down. And so, you know, we see this in the Scriptures, and we need to understand that that is still the same God today, and He's only going to have patience for so long. Patience is not unending. It does have an end. While God is long-suffering, there is a time when He says that's enough. You know, as we think about this parable, isn't it wonderful to have a gardener that has patience with us. Most people tell my mother she had to be a woman of great patience because she raised me. I think it's because she raised my other three siblings. But uh, I was easy. Yeah, yeah, you can smile, Aaron. I see Aaron. Aaron's just trying not to laugh at that one. But I'm so glad to have a Savior, someone who is mediating between me and the Father, someone who is patient with me. And, and we see that in this parable, and, and we can be thankful for it in this life. But we can also be thankful that not only is he patient with us, but he's working with us through his word to get us to maturity, to get us to that point where the Father is pleased with who we are. That it's not for by this time you ought to have been there, but for by this time you are there. You're right where I expected you to be at this point because you have given what you should to me. But isn't it a sad thought as we think about how wonderful it is to have the patience? Isn't it a sad and maybe even a scary thought to consider a time when Jesus finally acknowledges that there's nothing he can do to change my life anymore. A time where Jesus decides that I'm no longer walking in the light and he takes that blood away from me. That blood that continues to cleanse me. That's a scary thought. Hebrews 10 would go on to talk about that same idea and he would come to this conclusion it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God having reached that point. So while there is great hope and great uh, you know, uh, comfort that we can find in who Jesus is in regard to wanting to help us, folks, there is a side of this equation that requires me to do something. To give my part of it. And if I won't, then God will withdraw His. See, we draw near to God and He draws near to us. And we, we, saw, we saw on Wednesday night that God told them that you have went away from me, so now I've went away from you. See, there comes that moment where God, God goes away from us. 
and we're left back in that lost condition where we began. Maybe Jesus is working today in your life. Maybe He's desperately seeking a sign of growth. Constantly hoping that you will bear fruit. And what we can do tonight is to abide in Him. To immerse our lives in His teachings. And in the teachings of the New Testament. And allow those things to take root in our lives, grow within us, and enable us to bear spiritual fruit for our Lord. Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14. Jesus is in the last week of his ministry, and he's walking to the temple early one morning, and he sees a fig tree in the distance. And he's hungry. And the fig tree has leaves, so... Uh, he's thinking, okay, it has leaves, it probably has fruit, right? And he walks over to it, because it looks like a fig tree that would have fruit on it, but when he gets there, there's no fruit on it, and he curses it, and it dies right there on the spot. Now, after that day, they come back, and Peter sees the tree and says, hey, the tree's dead that you cursed the other day. And really what Jesus was talking about with that fig tree and why he cursed it, it was a symbol of of what was going on in Jerusalem with religious people. That the nation of Israel looked religious. They had the leaves of religion all over them, but in reality they had nothing. And folks, it's very easy for us as religious people to walk around with leaves of religion. And when Jesus puts his hand in the leaves, there's nothing but leaves. And I wonder if his reaction would be any different. We need fruit. We don't need to just look like Christians. We need to be Christians. Abide in Christ. Bear that fruit that makes us his. The Lord comes up to you. What does he find? Does he find a tree that needs help? A tree that needs work? A tree that needs another year? find a tree bearing much fruit for him? Does he find a tree that hasn't been bearing fruit for a long time? Whatever it is, may it be something that we look at, as we look at our own lives, we consider that question. May we change to ensure that we bear fruit, that we grow in the ways that God wants us to grow, that Jesus Christ wants us to grow. He's patient with us. He's doing everything on his side of the equation that can be done, may we do what we can. If we can help you with that this evening, we want to do so. We want to pray to you let us. Why don't you come as we stand as we stand?